Welcome to Cinema's Underbelly, the channel where we dive into the deepest, darkest trenches of the underground to analyze and review the most obscure, obscene, and controversial films that cinema has to offer. I'm your host, Jonathan Doe, and today we'll be reviewing the infamous 1967 cult classic, Violated Angels. On Wednesday, July 13th, 1966, in Chicago, Illinois, 23-year-old Richard Speck decided to go and act a series of violent attacks on women. Beginning with the brutal rape and robbery of 53-year-old Ella Mae Hooper, stealing her handgun. Then, at 10.20 p.m., dressed all in black and armed with Hooper's gun and a switchblade, he walked into the townhouse located on 2319 East 100th Street, a residence functioning as a dormitory for student nurses, where over the course of the night, Speck systematically tormented and murdered eight of these students. A ninth nurse named Corazon Amareu, who Speck was unaware of, escaped death because she crawled and hid underneath a bed during the attack. Speck would later attempt suicide after committing his crimes, but would fail this effort and be taken to the Cook County Hospital for treatment, where he would later be identified by a surgeon who then contacted the police and Speck was then arrested. Less than a year later, in 1967, Koji Wakamatsu's Violated Angels would be released, a primarily black and white pinky experimental film based on Speck's killing spree. Though only 56 minutes in duration, the film would become one of Wakamatsu's most infamous titles of his career, and would go on to be screened at the Cannes Film Festival in 1971. Though directly inspired by the Speck murders, the film's narrative does not follow the case with complete historical fidelity. The film instead has a relatively abstract and metaphorical structure and takes several artistic liberties in regards to its retelling of the real-life case. The film opens up to a man standing on the shore of an isolated beach as he uses a handgun to fire shots at an unknown target somewhere off-screen. The film then transitions to a student nurse's dormitory, where we find its occupants sleeping. The students appear to be roomed in groups of two. We then discover that in one of the rooms, a pair of roommates are having sex. This wakes up the rest of the dormitory, as the students all gather around a peephole in the door, where they can take turns gawking at their peers' fornication. Outside, one of the nurses notices that a man has stumbled out of the bushes, the same man we saw earlier in the film on the beach. She alerts some of the other students, and they invite the man into the dorm to join them in the spectacle. Except, when the man realizes what he's looking at, instead of enjoying the entertainment, he becomes enraged and decides to attack the two lovers shooting one of them and killing her. This rightfully puts the entire dormitory into terror and panic. The remainder of the film follows similarly to the events that took place in Speck's real-life killing spree, with the man attacking one woman after another, sexually assaulting them, and executing them with a gun or a blade. And though this plot structure seems simple enough that one might worry it could devolve into repetition and tediousness, Two aspects of the film that I quite admire is its tone and pacing, as well as its unique depictions of mental illness. The majority of the film is presented in black and white, with little to no music being displayed throughout the picture. The film scenes of violence are often depicted as long, stagnant shots, with only the sound of the creaking of the old dormitory building, the wind outside, or the whimpering of the victims filling the dead air as the women stay stuck frozen in fright, forcing the viewer to sit and stew in the unpleasantness and unease that is being depicted on screen. Juxtaposed to the film's depictions of dread being presented within the external environment, the film also features scenes that give us a glimpse into the antagonist's psychosis, with scenes where we see the women nightmarishly laughing and mocking right into the camera as if we are seeing it through the point of view of the killer. The film takes turns pulling us into the madman's psychotic delusions, and then rips us out and 
puts us back into the external environment and the reality of the horrific situation taking place, as if we are ping-ponging between two different dimensions of the same nightmare running parallel to each other. There is one scene in particular that really stood out to me. One of the students pleads with the killer to stop spilling blood and spare the lives of the remaining nurses, referring to herself and her doormates as white angels. The killer seems perplexed by this language and questions if a woman is capable of being an angel. The student combats this by saying all nurses are angels. As a rebuttal to her claim, the antagonist ties her to a chair, takes one of her dorm maids to the other room, and begins carving her up with his blade, almost as though he's using her as a piece of art he is molding and crafting to form his vision. When he is finished, he returns to the nurse in the chair and takes her to the other room to see his work. When we're finally shown this victim, the shot is first shown in vibrant color, but in the next shot, the film returns to black and white. As if we are seeing the same thing, but from both characters' perspectives. A clever way to give us the juxtaposition between psychosis and reality. After the killer's reign of terror has finally ended, he digresses into an almost infantile state being held and cradled by the last surviving student nurse. The film then returns to the beach, where we see these two characters frolicking and playing along the shore, before bringing us back to the dormitory, where we see that the surviving nurse is now gone, leaving us to wonder if this remaining nurse was even real, or simply a fragment of the killer's imagination, possibly symbolizing an angel. In the end, Violated Angels is a unique entry within the Pinku Cinema catalog. The film is experimental, raw, visceral, and abstract. I think it was bold of Wakamatsu to release a film only a year after such a horrific tragedy had taken place. Matching the film's release date to the date of the real-life crime, Wakamatsu must have begun production only months after the murders had actually occurred. If you're interested in learning more about the spec case, over on my other channel, Felicia Fisher and I recently visited the real-life dormitories where the incident took place. A link to that video will be shown in the description. I hope that you found this video interesting, and I hope to see you again. Until next time, this is Cinema's Underbelly. Have you subscribed to Jonathan Doe's new channel Murderabilia Show and tell yet? See authentic true crime relics and the infamous stories behind them. Go on field trip episodes with Doe and friends as they visit real historic crime scene locations. Listen to interviews with real convicted murderers as they explain their crimes in their own words. Meet special guests from the murderabilia community as they offer exclusive access into their personal collections. So what are you waiting for? Support the underground and subscribe today.